Welcome to Theorizing with a Hammer, and today I'm with Doug Green. He's the author of two biographies, one on Auguste Blanqui, which we have talked about before. Check our archives at the Symptomatic Redness podcast over at Zero Books from about two and a half years ago, I believe. Uh, um, but he's also um, the author of a book forthcoming from Zero, um, a critical biography of the ideas of Michael Harrington. And I wanted to speak to you, Doug, for a variety of reasons, but the biggest one, in addition to the side aim of promoting your book, which, of course, benefits me, um, well, actually, it doesn't really benefit me, except that it keeps my employer making money, um, the, the interesting state of things as the DSA has gone through its third growth spurt. Um, although each growth spurt, I think, is a little smaller than the last. And also, um, the DSA seems to be like the LDS Church in the fact that if one is a paper member, one probably stays a paper member for a long time. Um, but regardless, between 80 and 90K, depending on which numbers you believe, um, people are in the DSA, making it now the largest socialist organization since the SPA um, in its high point period in the 19 teens and 20s. However, saying that, I think adjusting for population, the SDS is still actually per, per population size larger than the DSA. It was 60K at a time when the U and the U S population was about two thirds what it is now. So, um, but that's just, you know, some statistical ephemera. Uh, what have you made of the fact that all these moribund sectarian organizations, um, the largest of which being the ISO, which was apparently much smaller than any of us thought, um, the, the, the post-mortem from the ISO was that it was actually, at the time of its complete collapse, only about 1,500 people. Um, what do you make that all these sectarian organizations, with the exception of a few remergent Stalinist parties, um, whose origins are not actually in Stalinism, we'll get to that later too, um, have kind of fed into the DSA? For example... The Trotskyists left in America seems to be solely represented by the Sparts and the I and the um, and the Grantite uh, IMT, and we can go into these distinctions for our listeners who don't know the fine points of of uh, the various factions of Trotskyism. But um, and even the IMT has done a significant campaign of dual membership with the DSA. Um, why do you think, what's your theory as to why the last decade has saw an organization that for its first three decades could not breach more than three to 5,000 people explode, um, towards the middle of the last decade, just explode hugely. I think there's a, well, first of all, I want to thank you for inviting me on to talk. I appreciate that. Um, and for the promotion of the book as well. But in terms of the DSA's growth, I think that, uh, you know, to their credit, that they were uniquely positioned to take advantage of a few things. One is like the economic crisis from 2008 is still rippling with us, even if it's not quite at those depths, although COVID has certainly played into that. There was the upsurges of Occupy, but especially the Bernie Sanders campaign in 2016. They, they were very upfront that they supported it, that they went all into that, and they recruited a significant number of people from that campaign. And in DSA, the barriers for membership are quite low. It is, uh, I think it's you pay just a few bucks at minimum, and you're in. You don't have yeah, to attend any courses or anything like that. And I would actually say cadre education is pretty, pretty voluntary <laughs> at minimum. That, that's been my uh, impression as well. 
So after the Sanders campaign of 2016, they I forget the exact numbers, but they had recruited a significant number. But what really did their boost of members was the was Trump's election that year, as they really jumped. And I think that they had just been put on the map with Sanders and mm -hmm. with all these economic crises and whatnot, and people just kind of flocked to them. And that brought their real first uh, growth spurt. I think they went from like five or 6,000 to like 20 or something thousand. And I believe the next growth spurt was AOC's uh, primary election in 2018. And that there's been kind of growth spurts since then with uh, the, the second Sanders campaign, COVID. And whenever there's like DSA in the news, that that yeah. really helps to uh, spur them. And other groups, you know, whatever else we say about their politics, some of them are just spinning their wheels, you know, doing whatever. Like the ISO really was the largest, you know, at least nominally Leninist group, but they really had no strategy beyond showing up to the next protest and whatnot. And they just was not a very, uh, democratic structure and DSA is uh, does not have those same problems as the ISO. It certainly has its issues which uh, we could get into but it ISO had a very entrenched leadership, very closed structure and a pretty high barrier for membership and it really didn't know what it wanted to do and it started to it had defections to DSA they had their convention a few years ago that essentially it was almost like a Khrushchev secret speech and it blew the, the group apart. And I think that there had been within ISO that a lot of leading members were, they just wanted to jump shit and ship and join DSA. Well, I, I think the elephant in the room there is they were also sitting on a multi-million dollar publishing um, you know, uh, project in addition to, unfortunately, the normal undemocratic and uh, as plagued Leninist organizations in general, um, rape scandals due partially to their undemocratic structures and their distrust of bourgeois law. I, I literally cannot think of a Leninist organization that has not had at least a sexual harassment scandal. I, um, I blame this partly myself on the on the sort of unmaterialist adoption of the 1921 uh, Bolshevik voting standards because they were upheld by Trotsky, uh, which is the, you know, the post-Civil War vote, uh, internal structure um, with slate voting and all that. And as anyone ever knows, open slate voting, people know how you vote, you can retaliate against them, et cetera, and so forth. So it leads to a very stable leadership. Um, stable meaning, you know, <laughs> Uh, yeah, the, yeah. <laughs> a bunch of things. Um, but we're not so much talking just about that. I mean, one of, one of the things about the DSA and Harrington is I, I come out of a, I was a fellow traveler in an organization that was technically the DSA's other um, organization, uh, organizations, not, the DSA's other organization is not really what it was. Um, it's technically the, the, the second heir to the SPA, the SPUSA, um, which the DSA also claims to be an heir of, to, with some legitimacy, even though there was a pretty big gap between when Harrington got the DSA going and when uh, the, the Shackman-Harrington division ended the original SPA in the 60s. Um, so the SPUSA is very similar, actually, to the DSA in its broad-based tendency, but is actually a party, which the DSA has deliberately never been, and um, also does not endorse um, bourgeois candidates um, off of a, uh, an interesting understanding of the United Front strategy. Um, which is always fun to explain to Americans, right? Because it actually is designed for parliament <laughs> and the congressional structure kind of throws it for a loop. Um, because the idea that you can have a 
a party that that uh, could sit in a Congress and not be part of the two major parties and also not side with either one of them except on specific issues just doesn't come up in America in the way that it might in most European and Asian parliaments. Um, so, you know, any any adoption of popular United Front strategies in the United States are always going to be interesting because they're trying to fit a European-Asian model to a uh, congressional context, which is set up completely differently. Um, regardless, though, uh, I think we see the results of that, right? The DSA is now by far, I, I, I think it's the clearinghouse of, of sectarian organizations because it's not like all these, sec, these sectarian tendencies have disappeared. They're now all just within a broader culture that is more explicitly tangential to the Democratic Party. Um, and since the DSA formally is not a party and does not want to be a party, it's hard to see exactly what it is. It's not like these are multi-tendencies within a party in any way, form, or fashion. Right. Um I mean, there are within DSA various caucuses that don't necessarily match like this is a Maoist or this is a Trotskyist or whatever. Some are kind of amalgams. They pick up elements of whatever, you know, of base building, of uh, you know, transitional demands or, or what have you. And some of them are populated by former members of uh, like the ISO or socialist alternative or whomever. And I'm, it seems right now the largest faction or at least one of the governing factions of DSA, it's kind of hard to I'm not sure exactly the phrase to use. It would be like the uh, groups like the bread and roses, the socialist majority caucuses, which are more, social democratic, democratic socialists. I don't see much of a distinction between those terms, but some people insist on it. And one has a revolutionary of... tradition and one was invented 20 years ago. <laughs> Fair point. <laughs> I mean, like as much as we can talk about how awful social Democrats are and how they've all become like capitalist or whatever, um, they do have, historically speaking, an orientation um, towards the second international. Sure. Whereas the the democratic socialist, from what I can tell, I don't really know what they are. Actually, it's one of the like most of them are social democrats, or some of them are Keynesians, and some of them are progressives who have convinced themselves that social goods is the same thing as socialism. Um, it's, you know, the, the whole left wing tendency, what the right wing says about us is true, but it's right. good. Um, <laughs> but I don't really know, like, if you ask me what, uh, what, 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 it, what were the beliefs you maintain to be a democratic socialist or a social Democrat actually p past 1945? Um, I don't know. Like, I don't know what you actually subscribe to. My understanding of it is you're right that social democracy going actually all the way back to Marx and Engels had that, you know, revolutionary tradition. Lenin, Trotsky considered themselves social democrats. There's obviously World War I, the Russian Revolution, and social democrats are the reformists. In terms of democratic socialism, is that seems to have come out after World War II and uh, in opposition to totalitarian communism, as they called it. So like the British Labour Party, the French Socialist Party, who supported the establishment of NATO and aligned with West, you know, the United States, men, the, uh, they adopted, a lot of them adopted this term. In terms of its practical differences, social democrats, at least after World War II, they tended to de-emphasize class struggle and want more like you know, just some kind of Keynesian welfare state or whatever, along like Sweden at, at best. Mm. Democratic socialism, at least as Michael Harrington envisioned it, want in the distant future some kind of transcendence of capitalism. How that happens is very um, murky and unclear. 
to be to be kind. I, I I think in practice there really isn't much of a difference between the two terms, but that's some of my understanding of it. Yeah, I I, I realize the branding, um, you know, but to me, by the time you get to the 1970s. Um, but you have the Mitterrand faction, or you have the neo the, the beginnings of neoliberalization under labor. Just mm -hmm. Heads up, people! It happened under labor before it happened under Thatcher. Um, just like it happened under Carter here before Reagan amped it up three notches. Um, that the the distinctions were really meaningless. Like the, there was still a sort of pro cult uh, for to use old commie terms or proletarian culture focus of democratic socialists that, that more the technocratic social democrats by the 60s had largely abandoned. Um, but as to actual policy differences or even ideas of what the future was, there was just this vague notion that this was a transitional step, um, which again was, a tr was traditionally also a position of the social democrats um, going all the way back to to you know even even post 1914 kowski right but like it's not a it's not a clear uh demarcation at all um to me it seems mostly like branding and in, in america since we're cut off from those ideas and also if you look at what substantively the policy um drivers for a lot of I mean, honestly, Doug, when you if you were to look at, say, Dennis Kucinich's platform from 20 years ago and the squad, what's the difference on economic policy? I really don't see much of one to, to tell you the truth. There isn't. And there's le and even kind of even more damningly, um, the progressives have taken weaker and weaker stand, stances on foreign policy, often mm -hmm. deferring to the more political realist and even, frankly, neoconservative elements of the Democratic Party in the foreign policy committees. So, which was not something that the 80s and 90s progressives would have mm -hmm. done. Um, and I think now that we can finally get this to the point of your book, I think this this led us to this interesting time period where you've seen the explosion of the Overton window in regards to people being willing to call themselves socialists and, and no longer carrying the stigma. But um, I tend to agree with Douglas Lane, who's arguing this against Zizek recently, that all that's actually meant is people call more things socialism than they used to, most of the policies are substantively pretty identical to what they what the progressives would have wanted in the 90s or early aughts. There are some differences, but like socialized medicine, that's not new. Free college for all, which I, I don't even know under current conditions would necessarily be a great idea. That's not new. And I'm not saying that because I think like tuition's great or that we should have student loans. I mean, I just... When you look, for example, at the studies of, of what free college has done in Germany, it benefits the wealthy more than it does the poor. Like, um, there it has not increased class mobility. So, what? How much do you think Harrington is to blame for this? <laughs> how much Just do I go ahead and poison the well from the beginning? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, to be clear, I. I, I... I, I did not go into writing the book liking Harrington, and I certainly did not finish the book liking Harrington anymore. But I think um, Harrington, Harrington himself, he embodies and he gave voice to a very particular type of politics mm -hmm. that shaped American socialism or social democracy, which is an orientation towards the Democratic Party, this pragmatism, opportunism. and I would say it it broadly shapes or it's the majority tendency on the American left. And in certain ways, it would be echoed even in Harrington's enemies, the, the uh, Moscow aligned Communist Party with its popular mm -hmm. frontism. And Harrington did not want to do things like he wanted to be the left wing of the possible. 
basically he wanted to, he, his strategy was meant to transform the Democratic Party, which he said was a party of racists and capitalists, but it had a, a popular base of, you know, civil rights, labor, environmentalists, feminists, all these kind of progressive groups. He wanted to shift all the, the bad elements of the Democratic Party over to the Republicans. The Democrats would become this social democratic party. Somehow they get into office, they'd institute all these reforms, we get Sweden, and then somehow we'd get socialism farther down the line. The thing is, and for him, this was, he actually said, this is the only place a beginning can be made is this realignment strategy. But in practice, it just ended up being sacrificing any independent organization on the outside. You know, he was the leader of the Socialist Party. The Socialist Party exploded or split over, you know, Vietnam and realignment and sacrificed that to stay in the Democrat Party. And in practice, that meant uh, giving cover to the Democrats for the Vietnam War, for vicious cutbacks that they do. And when Harrington even tried to be a part of protest movements, it ended up he couldn't really effectively do it because he didn't want to alienate the Democrats because he wanted to keep his foot in the door. So he, if you want to stay in the Democrat party, you have to do Democratic party things. They might tolerate some reformism, but you have to be anti-communist. You can't question the prerogatives of American imperialism abroad. And that, that is very, that, promotes a, a form of pragmatism opportunism where Harrington just ends up every four years writing the same article to support LBJ, Hubert Humphrey, whoever the Democratic front runner is, the same article, defeat those evil Republicans, it'll create more space for the left, but you end up just demobilizing people because without your own independence, your own ability to maneuver, to strategize, you really can't do anything. And even if Harrington did create or was head of several organizations, that was always sacrificed come election season. And those organizations in practice just ended up being a fig leaf on the Democratic Party. And sadly, even, you know, that, that has characterized a lot of the American left, even DSA today, I suspect most members have not read Harrington. They don't know who he is. But a lot of that, those politics of pragmatism, opportunism, the orientation of the Democratic Party, it's almost in the air they breathe. It's in their yeah. daily practice. I mean, I remember I felt strange when uh, Bhaskar Sankara was being weirdly honest about the fact that um, their market socialist Austro-Marxism strategy was also based on explicitly the popular front, except this time the Social Democrats and not the Stalinists were going to be in charge. Um, Charlie Post wrote a good response to this, um, whatever the limitations of Post politics, he, he does understand the history of popular frontism mm -hmm. um, and also the compromises the labor movement itself had made in the 1940s and 50s to, to maintain um, that frontism to, you know, and what did they get for it? They got purged from the CIO. So like, um, you know, so th it's a history that, that one can even say that by 1968, you should have known better. Like arguing that in the fifties to me seems defensible, but arguing that after the Vietnam war, um, quite clearly wasn't. And and even someone who is considered a, you know, quote unquote, right wing socialist, like, you know, my boy, Chris Lash, who I think has mischaracterized our people reading his late career into his early career when they say that, but he criticized Harrington mm -hmm. um, explicitly for, for using populism um, to get the, to, to get the left into another popular front with the Democrats in a way that was going to, um, lead to burnout he thought um and you know no reconfiguration of working class institutions and the class politics were getting weaker and weaker um and that was lash's critique of of harrington when he was alive um 
So, I mean, it was it was it was clear to people before even the DSA existed. Um, what I find interesting is that in the aughts, people were still pretty frustrated with the Democrats. They remember the Democrats' stance on the Iraq War. They remembered, and so um, even with people who were somewhat famous, like Barbara Ehrenreich and uh, Cornell Rest being in the DSA in the aughts, nobody joined it. Like when I was looking, like I looked at it and I was like, they're just Democrats. That was exactly what I was like. Oh, it's like, these are the people who go on democracy now. Who cares? Um, and I, I, I think the one thing that we left out of this was Jacobin and Sankara uh, um, specific like revitalization strategy. And I will give Baskar Sankara credit for picking up on a pulse of something and being able to make the DSA seem radical again, despite its historical relationship to the Democrats. And its confederated nature leads to some weird things. I mean, like, for example, a lots of the locals will try to remove the band on uh, Democratic centralist organizations, having their members join the org. Um, so you'll see groups even as quote unquote radical and anti anti-electoral as the um, the Freedom Road Socialist Organization, the radical one, not the, you know, the more Maoist one, they'll sometimes get into even the local leadership committees in a DSA caucus. And one wonders how that happens because neither side is supposed to allow that. Um, but such as the pool of feeling like you have a bunch of socialists to do something. The DSA also has caucuses for everybody. I mean, we're, we're talking about small caucuses here, but they have a they have a primitivist caucus. Like, so I mean, in in effect, the DSA maybe in some way, as Harrington actually maybe wanted it to be and never could achieve during his own lifetime, it is everything and nothing to the American left. Right? You can go in there with almost any set of beliefs that are that are even vaguely adjacent to leftism and find some home somewhere. Mm -hmm. So I just want to pick up on what you said about Jacobin for a second. And uh, first of all, Bashkar Sankara, he's longtime DSA member, and he's also been explicitly influenced by Harrington, cites him as an influence. And he says that in a um, number of interviews. And if you read his book, The Socialist Manifesto, a lot of actually his understanding of like the U.S. history, third uh, liberation movements comes from Harrington. And Jacobin is, I think it, it, it's always been like, it's guiding politics have been DSA influenced, but it has been very clever, very intelligent in having very, it's very flashy, it's very good looking. Um, you know, I don't think currently, but in the past, I think it's actually been graphically very impressive. And it, ha it generally has a wide variety of articles, you know, from different people. You know, uh, you mentioned Charlie Post. He's pu he's been published there a few times, even if he's uh, doesn't share like Bashkar Sankar's politics. I mean, they even have stuff on Bordiga in there. I mean, so like ultra yeah. ultra comms and stuff can get into Jacobin if they wish. Right, and, th and that's smart. I mean, yeah. like <laughs> But the thing is, when it comes like, and I think when it comes to like day to day politics, that stuff they don't let influence. They might be willing to say, oh, we'll have a nice anniversary issue on the founding of the Communist International, which they did, and the history was okay, but then it ended up being, none of this matters, really. Let's just campaign for AOC, which that was actually in the article. And so that I think that that's actually very good marketing, because you know I remember in 2017 that they had... Uh, pieces uh, celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Russian Revolution, some of which were good, some not so good. Mm -hmm. But it didn't change the fact that whatever quote-unquote progressive Democrat was out there, they wanted to um, you know, promote and whatnot. And in, in both 2016 and 2020, that they went very hard for Bernie Sanders. In 2016, there was kind of a more almost honest opportunism about it. Like they actually at times even had dissenting voices. In 2020 or 2019, 20, they had 340 articles on Bernie Sanders. And 
they're all pretty much the same. There was no criticism. It was just how great he was, how we're going to change everything and, you know, end poverty and everything. Even stuff Sanders himself wasn't promising. It was just, um, I mean, it's like, you know, talk about North Korea's cult of personality. They, they certainly had one. And, you know, as a marketing, as a brand tool, yeah, they, they certainly got subscribers. They certainly helped build DSA that way. And it's, but, and it's interesting too, it's actually not the official DSA organ, even no. if everyone associates. It's, that's Democratic Left, which, it, which is a really boring paper if you've ever read it. Like yeah, I, read, I have, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I read <laughs> some, of the er, some of the early issues for research on Harrington. It was poorly put together. You know, we, we joke about left and, leftist organizations and paper. Papers, that one was just, you know, it's like just boring. And uh, the recent ones are just, they don't use it as even an organizing tool at all. I think they just like maybe mail it out to members. So Jacobin is the unofficial DSA paper, I would say, or organ, however you want to put it. And it's- Which means, yeah, which to me means there's a whole cottage industry that's effectively a DSA organ, because you could throw in Nathan Robinson's current affairs as adjacent to it. You mm -hmm. can throw in, definitely their scholarly journal, Catalyst Mag, and I, yeah. I, um, I won't say much about that one way or the other, about my opinions on that. Um, you could definitely include the way Tom Frank has taken the baffler after the success of Jacobin um, into sort of like mini publishing sphere. But, and, and, and not to say that the, the socialist left in America hasn't grown or what calls itself social left haven't grown massively during this time period. But when we look at what we're, what we're dealing with, right. Um, are they going to really oppose Biden in a way that would risk um, Democratic Party hegemony in the federal government? No, they're Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You know, so, I mean, yeah, they're 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 actually in a weird place now with Biden because they have to kind of do both things. So technically, a DSA at I think believe twenty nineteen they voted in favor of the quote unquote dirty break strategy that they would eventually form an independent organization. And the dirty break is basically let's elect a bunch of socialists on the democratic party line. Cause they can and get a lot of them and eventually break off and form their own independent party. The thing is um, all, and they've currently they have about a hundred or so elected members yeah. in the Democratic Party, I think almost all of them. And what's interesting about that is none of these politicians apparently are in on this dirty break. Like if you actually read it, like what AOC says, she's, you know, in DSA or she has been, she says, oh, I want to bring the Democratic Party home back to the New Deal, back to the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. That's basically realignment. And all these other ones in, are in, are just acting as Democrats. They may be in favor of the New Deal or whatever, but it also, the r dirty break comes into the same obstacles of realignment, the whole Democratic Party structures. It's uh, controlled by the, the liberal wing of the capitalist class. But to so say like the people DSA, writing their um, economic policy aren't DSA socialists, they're MMTers. Like, yeah. like, and they're not even the most left-wing MMTers, frankly. I mean, so like, like I like Rowan Gray; he's a pretty cool guy, um, uh, and I I actually think for MMT policy he's doing good work. But like that's who's writing the bills for, sure. for the squad, not not even the DSA's caucuses. So like, and I'm sure some of these MMTers are in the DSA, but I'm not even I'm not even sure they would consider themselves socialist, or if they spelled out what they considered socialist in the most left wing faction of it. That any like that most of us would recognize it, um, and I find it interesting that this isn't dealt with within the DSA itself. It actually, to me, seems to be digging its head in the ground on these issues in specific, and also about negotiating with the larger Democratic Party and pulling it left. What did the DSA gain? Because while it is true that the DSA did do better 
um, uh, than you know centrist Democrats did. They're also they also tend to be in districts that you could put a shoe with a D on it, and yeah. they would still win. Um, and in some of those areas, um, the, the Biden still polled better than the Dem than the DSA candidate did. So what are they bringing to the table? I think what they bring to the table is a number of things. First of all, um, they didn't really gain anything. Having a better Democratic Party program means nothing because the Democrats just ignore that as, as they see fit. Is the Democratic Party gains a lot of new phone bankers, to tell you the truth, a lot of new people to get out the vote for them. So a lot and of free canvassing is what I like. Would really, have. that's like the where I live. A lot of the local DSA members were canvassing for uh, Ed Markey, who has oh, bailed gosh. out Wall who bailed out Wall Street, voted for the Iraq War, but they were campaigning for him. And that's they, embarrassing. I mean, I don't think that they haven't changed the Democratic Party one iota. They a lot of them they vote for. They may abstain from certain votes, but they vote for some of these really reactionary bills. AOC has voted for a few military budgets. She's uh, been in favor of things like democracy promotion in Venezuela, which is just you know code for you know get rid of who the U.S. doesn't like down there. And they Probably they seem to on the on the DSA's um, divest plank on Israel too. So. Yeah, the other thing about that is I'm not sure how real that, that their commitment to things like that is because Bernie Sanders has voted multiple times to fund the IDF. I'm not sure how you can support uh, BDS and support someone who votes to fund the IDF or support Joe Biden, who is very vocally pro-Israel, and then support BDS. It seems like quite a disconnect there. And I think they're still... They they just seem to be trying to find, a, a, I guess, their negotiating angle. Because if, you know, the more lefty socialists were, were like out in like the BLM protests in the, in the last spring and uh, DSA just kind of, uh, certainly members were marching in that and, and whatnot. But as an organized group, they really didn't do much. And with like, an official count of 90,000, it certainly is punching far below their weight. If you look at, say, 70s uh, leftist groups, they could punch far above their weight, you know, getting uh, in mass movements, organizing campaigns and whatnot, whatever else we say about their politics, of course. Whereas DSA, it just seems they're just so heavily focused on electoralism. That's just like the gravitational pull. And I'm not really sure what they are intending to do? Are they, are they going to support some kind of lefty challenger to Biden or Harris in four years? No way. No, way. no way. No way. no way. I mean, it's... <sighs> I mean, the DSA has this plausible deniability, though, with its face, and it's... And I, I'll get back to you. Um, maybe we can tie this back into Harrington, because it just seems like now we're just... <laughs> this is a barn and green just go after the DSA, letting all the all their years of pent up frustration with people talking about how awesome the DSA was. You know, there there is a way in which the DSA could be salvaged. Um, but the, the the problem that I've seen is the groups who who have a good plan for the DSA are trying to do to the DSA what the DSA is trying to do to the Democratic Party. <laughs> um <laughs> And so, and of course, that means that, you know, they, they become a very militant faction that can't do much. And, and the DSA is very interestingly structured. I mean, there's a bunch of problems that one can see in it. Um, its leadership is, you know, overwhelmingly of cover uh, of color and female, but it's actually, its membership is like 80% white male. Um, it's maybe not that high, but it might like... I don't get those stats easily. And when I've gone to DSA caucuses around the country, and I have done this a couple of times, um, when I would go uh, for other, you know, for my day job, 
our four poetry tour, I would stop by the DSA in an area because I was interested in what they were doing and I would do free, you know, I have no problem working with working with the DSA. I just refused to join. Um, and I would go and talk to them and then occasionally get heckled by ISO people at DSA events because I thought I was a DSA or which was weird. Um, and, um, and I was like, well, you guys aren't that different from the democratic party anyway. Um, <laughs> like you just, you know, and I've mentioned how Draper and they get mad. Um, but the the actual experience I saw is you had some very good people on the ground. If it was a Republican city or even a Democratic city in a very red state where they also couldn't have effect on the Democrats, the DSA was pretty radical in that area. All right. And, that, and, and while that seems counterintuitive at first, when you think about it, it makes sense because like, yeah, you can't have direct influence on politics in this way that's going to pull you towards electoralism. There's also probably not a lot of order other places for people to go other than maybe the PSL, the party for socialism liberation and some of these areas. Those are literally your only two options. So you have a radical DSA. Okay. But you have it at, a, at the chapter level full of like Maoists and anarchists and whatever. And they'll go, they'll do, um, uh, you know, local mutual aid stuff, but they have absolutely no pull on the national. Absolutely none. And the DSA always has this plausible deniability because of its hyper confederation. Because you're like, oh, we have these radical chapters, and we have these fairly rad. We have some fairly radical tendencies, you know. But those those effects on the leadership councils or on the on the central caucuses just aren't there like at all um and so one of the things i've noticed is a tendency for people to get fed up with this and and a lot of the liberalism and a lot of the progressive cultural capital mongering and the dsa whatever but instead of moving now towards more traditionally sectarian organizations since they seem discredited a lot of these people actually end up moving right wing mm -hmm. um uh, you know, the quote unquote post left um, emerges a lot of out of this frustration, I think. And then the other way that you can signal your distinction from the DSA is to play act being a Stalinist in a context where it makes no sense and doesn't matter. Um, and so, you know, but effectively, as far as I can tell, everyone kind of has the same politics. I I, th I think uh, a lot of that makes sense. Like I, when I say like, uh, and, and I get people get mad at me when I say this. Like, oh, they're a wing of the Democratic Party, and it's like, well, we have this caucus, that caucus, and like, and it's like certainly that they're you know different caucuses emphasize different things. And I remember reading one is like talking about how bad the Democrats are, but you 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 read the fine print, it's like, oh, you're advocating the same thing as this much more openly right wing uh, caucus there and whatnot and certainly like dsa does attract you know it it's like almost like the entryway for some people to the left and yeah they, they may come in there trying to figure out things out they may like this bit of social democracy anarchism or or maoism or whatever the hell it is and i th i think you, you can actually do you really as far as i can tell i don't see an organized tendency that's saying, let's expel these opportunists, let's remove people like AOC from the DSA or, you know, and whatnot. I don't see that. And, and but you're right, there are certainly like experimentation on the ground. Like I've met some very dedicated like labor people who are in DSA, one's a very good friend of mine. But, you know, it, it ends up being this weird kind of disconnect where it's like, you're trying to like, just focus on whatever it is you're doing, but ignoring the wider politics of the group. And I just, I just don't see that like as super sustainable long term. And I almost feel like some of this experimentation comes in, like on these like off year elections, where it's like, okay, we we don't have an election campaign around the corner, so we're going to promote, you know, you can kind of do this, and we might talk a little more left wing. Like I remember. Uh, was it? I mean, there was all the talk about the dirty break, 
you know, which seemed like this kind of new radical left strategy, which apparently all those people in 2020 were now campaigning for Joe Biden, which is just kind of an interesting development. And I think because you don't have like a really clear, whether sectarian left group or whatever outside the DSA to attract people, you're right. Some of them just want to be relevant. They think, oh, we have these people in Congress. So it's like we're in those halls of power. So it's like the move, like the gravitational pull to the right and thinking like, oh, we can influence policy. And I see people on Facebook who, you know, they, they've gotten like people who a few years ago, you know, who are in DSA, they get people who were a few years ago, like talking like Leninists to talk like policy wonks, you know, like Elizabeth Warren about how to get this bill passed and all this. And it's, it, it just kind of goes to show like just how dominant, like the kind of you, the liberal reformism just really is. And it, it's, it's frustrating to tell the truth because it's like you you said you point out like the historical problems like that. It's like oh you're being sectarian or um, you know let's just give this a try or diversity of tactics, which I think I I, I really dislike that phrase for a lot of reasons. Just because I think it's like a cover for oh we should be we shouldn't tell people to not campaign for Biden or or whatever. So yeah, well it's. One of the things I find very interesting about this, and and uh, I think we'll we'll end on this thought and then go back to Harrington, um, is a moderately unsuccessful New York comedian with with rightish Gen X progressive politics um, can just by being an obnoxious asshole really show that the DSA doesn't mean what it says. And I'm referring here to Jimmy Dore. Right. Um, and I personally am embarrassed that Jimmy Dore is the person doing this. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and because I don't think he's, I don't think Jimmy Dore's campaign is helping Medicare for all, uh, for all campaigners. I know a lot of people are frustrated with it. I don't think that, that, that actually just pointing out through another vote that the Democrats are a neoliberal party is going to change much because it's not like we haven't had a thousand chances for that to happen. But what I do find interesting about what he's doing is he can literally quote the DSA's policy papers back at them for his own strategy. And then they will get really defensive about it. Um, not, I mean, I'm sure there's people in the DSA who are door fans, but like the vast majority of them are defending AOC and AOC is clearly defending Pelosi. And just and and just to put things out on the table, we must remind ourselves that Pelosi was effectively an AOC of the 1980s herself. Even down to the fact that Italian Americans weren't fully considered white when mm -hmm. she was um, the head of the, one of the young, you know, firebrands in the Progressive Caucus in the 80s. So. 80s or early 90s but anyway but i mean you know when i was a wee babe um and i think it's fascinating that we that we're literally watching this cycle in real time i i realize that aoc is one of the most popular politicians in america right now because she she is effective she is very effective at using the internet um but I have to say that, like, if this is what the DSA has been building, I'm unimpressed. You can have a, you can have a, like, a comedian with a podcast who, who is shilling for someone like Chris Hedges, who I would have considered a right wing, you know, progressive ten years ago. I mean, he, I, he has moved left, um, but like, yeah. I remember him complaining about about Occupy tactics in 2012. Oh, me too. So you know the fact that he's like somewhat opposed, you know, running to the left of the of the D of the DSA on a similar populist platform to what Harrington, uh, tying it all back, um, would have actually pushed with McGovern. Um, and it seems like not only did we not get Bernie Sanders, it seems like we've actively saved the center of the Democratic Party for for very little. 
And when I say very little, I, I I still was watching people spin the fact that Bernie, you know, being being given this uh, ability to see, oversee the committee that's going to do budget reconciliation was going to mean all these progressive reforms. And I'm like, you guys are going to barely get the Biden COVID stimulus through with Bernie sitting on that convention and he can't even stop them from adding additional means testing that basically means that almost no one in in a city like LA is going to get that stimulus check like what is going on I mean first of all I I did not even know who Jimmy Dore was until this whole thing happened and I suddenly it was all over my news feed on Facebook and I'm like who the hell is this guy and I watched most of that uh one of one of the his podcasts and you're right he's really an asshole and i really wish i didn't do that because i can't get that time back again but you're right he uh you know he was pointing out their statutes for excuses i also think it's like at a certain level it's also like a lot of people are latching on to this thinking like this will be the moment we're going to finally expose the democrats as if there is there's been like a million moments <laughs> that they've been exposed. The Iraq war wasn't enough. Like. <laughs> yeah. Which, and you know, if you know, but you're right, you know, AOC, like one of her campaign slogans, Medicare for all, that was, it, that's been one of the huge DSA rallying cries. And yeah, she, uh, she essentially is like, we're not going to do this. And maybe she's right on this kind of nitty gritty of the, of the congressional procedure. I don't know but it is kind of like this parliamentary opportunism and there's no thought about let's get in the streets or, or, you know, camp have sit-ins major protests. It's just like, let's just trust the, the Congress as if that that's a great, great idea. And, you know, I think I don't particularly, like I said, I don't like door. He's has uh, he's had like groups like the, boogaloo boys on and oh like yeah the, door, door's a mess and, and it's and, like and maybe this is just a case of like broken clock with him on this issue but he's like he's not the best spokesperson for this but in terms of people like aoc sanders and, and a lot of them i think they they actually form uh uh they they do something for the democrat party they the democrats just like the republicans are they're corporate owned. They're owned by the, the wealthy classes in this country. But the Democrats, they always want to put on this play where the party of the people, where the party of the workers, the party of black people, of immigrants, and they, they need the people like AOC. They need the people like Sanders. Just like in this back in the day, they had people like Bella Abzug who or whomever. Uh, the Rainbow always, Coalition, like like people yeah. seem to forget, like the Jesse Jackson campaign had a lot of these same, actually some of the same people even. Yeah, um, and and you know to all uh, to bring it back to Jackson, like he's a he didn't he never called as far as I know he never called himself any form of a socialist, but within the confines of the Democratic Party, he was far to the left of Sanders, not only promising like New Deal type legislation and actually building more or less a Rainbow Coalition, actually. Uh, but he also, he was like anti-apartheid. He was far better on, you know, issues of Palestine and at that time, Central America. In a way, Sanders never questioned any of like, you know, the U.S. empire's prerogatives abroad. Whereas I mean, Jackson, to his credit, was willing to at least bring some of that out, which kind of I shows you like how far right, you know, it's gone since then. No, no, I, I think you're right about my only, my only, my only thing I would say about this not to defend Bernie entirely, but that Bernie did try that once. And then he went and talked to the Sandinistas and um, he gets pissy if you ask him about that to this day. So, you know, so when he did try to reach out to the, you know, the Latin American formal left, he got such a backlash from in, in, in America that he just got, he seems to have gotten quiet on it and he is defensive on it. Like I've seen, and it, weirdly, it's always like Vox reporters and shit trying to be like, well, why don't you talk about what you said about the Sandinistas and your visit mm -hmm. to the Soviet Union? And he's just like, I'm not, no. I mean, you see Sanders get all weird. And you would think he'd be proud of that given 
you know, some of the of the positions that the DSA would take. Now, fine, you know, Sanders is not Harrington. Um, and I always like to point out that even someone who I don't particularly love myself, Murray Bookchin, like what was on to Sanders' game mm. on playing both sides of this as early as the mid 80s. <laughs> so like it's not it's not a new problem. Um I just wanted to like make sure that we didn't get totally, you know, people like, oh well, Sanders, you know, supported the right, right. Yeah, he did, and now he doesn't talk about it. Um and I, you know, you can almost quote Bernie Sanders against himself up to and including 2000, you know, and 18 till the right before a second presidential one about his frustration with the Democrats. Um, who, but this brings us all the way back. I mean, it, it, as fun as it is to, you know, in some ways attack the mainstay of my audience, <laughs> I am sure this is going to have a very active comment section from DSAers. Um, uh, I think it's I think it's to me unobjectable, I mean undeniable that we have saved a center of the Democratic Party. And like people who were attacking, for example, Kamala Harris is, you know, is is as late as six months ago, um have gotten really quiet about, you know, this progressive, you know, um senator um whose voting record is very slight. Um, like like Obama's, because I remember also Obama, technically speaking, when evaluated by the progressive voting people, had a more progressive voting record than Bernie Sanders because he'd only been in the Senate for a year and didn't vote on a lot um, and had not made any like um, trades or, pro or procedural gains or any of that to get legislation passed. Um, although if anyone had listened to Obama's rhetoric, who would have known he was a center-rightist Democrat all the way through, and that was always the case. Um, I mean, I remember quoting stuff to people in 2010 about, like, well, he said this. I mean, like, you should have just listened to what he said. You shouldn't have believed the people who told you he was the most progressive, you know, uh, person in Cong. I mean, in Congress. I mean, come on. Um, I mean, I, I will even defend Obama in the sense that he wasn't even like hiding his positions on certain things. Like for example, the Iraq, the Iraq war, like he was always against the Iraq war, but he was always for the Afghan war. And people mm -hmm. were shocked when he did the troop ramp up. And I'm like, it's, he said it. Why didn't you just listen to what he said? Um, what I found fascinating about this time period is that, I'm not even seeing the shock anymore from people who are ostensibly more left left wing than the people complaining 10 years ago, because the people who were frustrated with Obama were like people writing for the New York review of books. We're not talking about Maoist here. Um, you know, we're talking about Rob Reich. I mean, I guess Rob Reich actually was a Maoist in the sixties, but like, I like know that. yes. Wow. <laughs> um, I'm going to have to look that up later. <laughs> Sorry. Rob Reich and David Horowitz and all those fun people were all in like Maoist and Jason parties at one point. But but you know, in, in all seriousness, though, like they, they're you're not in an area or a time period where where I'm even seeing the old pushback from the progressives. It seems like it seems like there really was a sense in like during the Trump years when Trump would like accidentally stumble into a peace policy, and I don't want to paint. Trump is good on international relations because he, you know, tripled our drone strike, completely right. changed. Anyone who works with international stuff knows that it's not been a great time for people who are still under the purview of the U.S. empire. It's been a lot worse. Um, but that, you know, no new wars were started. Now, I don't think Biden's going to start a new war because I don't think U.S. empire really can right now, honestly. I think, the, I think the awakening of China and Russia constrain an inner imperial um, competition constrain the U.S. in ways that leftists just can't seem to imagine. They don't think in those terms. Um, they seem to think that countries have, you know, agency completely of their own accord um, and can just do whatever the hell they want. Um, and I guess in some degree they could, but that's not, I don't think we're going to see anything like that. Um, I think you're going to see a lot of people getting quiet on foreign policy again. I think you're going to see a lot of people getting quiet on deportation policy again. 
even though Biden is significantly more per, um, progressive than Trump on this matter, is even more progressive than I expected him to be. But there's still deportations going on. Um, I think we're going to see a whole lot of stuff. And I think what one of the things with Biden is the bar was set so low that I've even seen people like Doug Hinwood, frankly, defend Biden lately only because the bar was set so low. Yeah, I mean, it's this is a very crude analogy, but it's like, you know, saying Biden is better. It's like, yeah, it's like being the thinnest person in fat camp, you know. That's like, okay. It's like, yeah, he, he's not going to make the overtly um, racist remarks that Trump is and, and, and everything, but blatant the kind of systemic you know it's systemic racism is still there and i would agree with you i don't see him starting a new any new wars certainly not in the foreseeable future there's certainly going to be some coups and whatnot abroad uh but it's also interesting when trump pulled uh troops out of northern syria like uh, aoc condemned that actually and right. uh and I think with a lot of liberals and social democrats, especially, yeah, like imperialism is like just such an Achilles heel, is they, they'll condemn Trump for all sorts of things, which pretty much all of it he should be condemned for. But then when Biden does almost all the same things, that's you, you can't go after that because I guess they have a D next to their name. I'm really not sure exactly what what the, the the rationale is beyond that it's not like biden for example isn't going to continue our hostilities with china we right. have trouble with normalizing relations with china um there you know uh he might not do it as blatantly and there might be a lot more ways to save face which ultimately is a good thing mm -hmm. i mean like i'm 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 sure. a political realist to under, enough to understand that but like Come on, it's 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 you're right. It's not a difference in kind; it's a difference in degree. And but we've been talking around all this in modern because it, whenever you get to talk about the DSA and Biden and whatever, I mean, I, I do this show all the time, and people accuse me of get, offering up two hours a week of left on left violence, um, which I like to remind them: if it was proper left on left violence, they wouldn't be complaining to me about it in a couple hours, but. <laughs> You know, I, you know, like I'm not 1937ing anybody, but um, the, I do think we have to deal with the legacy of Harringtonism by understanding Harrington. And you wrote a biography of the man. Um, <laughs> how did Harrington become Harrington? Well, I, I guess the, best way to start is at the beginning. He's, it was an Irish Catholic born in Missouri, 1928. Mm -hmm. So he came of age in a very Catholic family, very Democrat family, very, and that was his worldview. He, was, he went to Jesuit schools and his family is rather affluent. So he didn't really experience the effects of the depression. And he didn't even, he, he was too young to have fought in World War II. As a young man, you know, he was trying to figure out his way in life, and he he wanted to be a poet. His father wanted to be a lawyer, and he kind of likes a lot of these bohemian crowds. So he's going, you know, these kind of left wing circuits in like Chicago, New York, and along this way, he kind of loses and regains his faith. Then he joins the Catholic Worker Movement in New York. That's Dorothea Day, and they're kind of a more or less left-wing Catholics, mm -hmm. and they take vows of poverty, which is something he really takes to. And this is kind. Of, and he's also a he's also a pacifist for a certain amount of time, which is also kind of like it has its own that sticks you out during the middle of like the Korean War. And he's actually a conscientious objector in the Korean War. But I think what really starts Harrington on his path is in the early fifties. 
he finally loses his Catholic faith and he joins uh, the Socialist Party of America, the party of Debs, which is then the party of Eugene Thomas. And he's not in the Socialist Party for very long and he joins a group called the International Socialist League, I'm sorry, the in Independent Socialist League, which is led by Max Schachman. And Max Schachman mm -hmm. is, um, He's probably Harrington's most important political mentor. Even after Harrington breaks with Shackman later on, he still, in one of his books, he's like, he dedicates it to Shackman. And Shackman has his own interesting history. He was a early member of the Communist Party, an early member of the Trotskyist movement. And he split with Trotsky in 1939-40 uh, uh, over essentially the Soviet invasion of Finland where Trotsky, uh, to simplify a bunch, Trotsky saying the Soviet Union is still a worker state, however degenerated. And Shackman is saying it's just a new imperialist power, it's this new evil empire. And he develops this theory called bureaucratic collectivism. And it's not really, a, you know, at least with Shackman, it's not a coherent or developed say, theory. Yeah. Of it's not a developed theory at all. Basically, of all the Trotskyist theories, the Shackman version of bureaucratic collectivism is like. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I've read enough of it to say it's, it's, unless you really are, want to left nerd out, you know, that's, uh, it's not worth your time. But basically, after World War II, uh, Shackman sees the Soviet Union and, you know, the China and whatnot as greater evils there, this, they're going to enslave the world. They're totalitarian empires, Russia, China. So we need to support Western imperialism. And he wants to, you know, he supports uh, labor bureaucrats, you know, because they're anti-communist. And he sees the possibilities for, because he's supporting labor bureaucrats who are tied to the Democrat Party, he kind of sees the possibilities of maybe realigning the Democratic Party of maybe getting more progressive people in there, more pro-labor people in there. And Harrington, when he joins with Shackman, kind of absorbs all of this. And sh I think Harrington in a certain way actually like really develops and refines it. And that's a lot of that is more or less his worldview. He certainly breaks with Shackman later on, I think more secondary and tactical things. But he, he kind of sticks to this core worldview of anti-communism, of reformism, of work in the Democrat Party, and support for the labor bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. And eventually, it, it's very hard to be in, an independent, in a small socialist group pretty much any time in American history, but it's very hard in the 50s with McCarthyism, with the rampant anti-communism. And there comes a point where the Shack Shackman and crew realize they need they want to grow, and there's kind of an opening because the Communist Party is essentially collapsing after Khrushchev, and the Socialist Party is essentially they're an old folks' home. They're all old people. It's just like a husk of an organization. So, long story short, Shackman and Harrington join the Socialist Party and essentially become the leaders of it at the end of the fifties. And this is a, a period of time where struggle is kind of opening up, the civil rights movement is happening, there's gonna be the student movements and, and what have you, and you know, third world movements, Vietnam. And they want to essentially become this new pole for a new, a new left, a new socialist party that is going to unite labor, the civil rights movement and whatever. But they're all trying to do it through, Harrington is trying to do it through realignment he wants to get involved in the Democratic Party. And that means accepting, which he does, anti-communism. And it also means no towing to a lot of the racists. When the Mississippi Freedom Democrat Party tries to essentially put a realignment strategy in, in practice, you know, a more progressive platform, you know, black people and white progressives are uniting they're essentially shut out by the Democratic Party leadership. And Harrington and his uh, close comrade at the time, Bayard Rustin, support that. It's like, you know, we don't want the Republicans to win. You guys have just got to accept this. 
And in the civil rights movement, uh, when Harrington is involved with it, that he supports anti-communist clauses, to make sure any you know real or potential reds are kept out. And Harrington is actually very influential behind the cre uh, the Port Huron statement that re uh, that founds SDS in 1962, and people like Tom Hayden who this is actually one of the ironic things. I actually felt sorry for Tom Hayden in this whole episode. I don't like him actually in, 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 on the whole. Hayden is one of the authors of the Port Huron Statement, which is kind of this left-wing social Democrat plat statement, maybe left liberal. It's really, not, it's not a revolutionary document, I would say, but it incorporates a lot of Harrington's ideas about, you know, we need to support the labor movement. We need to support, um, the civil rights movement. We want to change the Democratic Party, but one thing it does, it's it's uh, it actually it's actually blames both the United States and the Soviet Union for the Cold War. Equally, it's almost like a, a real third campus document, which Harrington is incensed by. He's he essentially puts Hayden and other members of SDS on trial. And it's like, how dare you do this? And at one point, I believe the SDS convention had a member of the, the Young Communist League just as an observer. And it's like, why would you do this? It's like having a Nazi in the room. And they eventually are actually able to patch things up. Harrington kind of admits he overreacted, but he admits later on that there would have been a split with them anyway because of essentially the Vietnam War. When Vietnam happens, SDS more or less moves to an anti-war position mm -hmm. and it moves steadily to the left by the time you have it's 1969 it's splitting into maoist groups and harrington just doesn't accept that for him he he officially is opposed to the vietnam war i i but it's a question really of how to oppose the vietnam war harrington doesn't want to do anything like no street demonstrations don't have anything that's even remotely pro-communist. Don't do anything that alienates the Democratic Party. Nothing illegal, nothing like that. So in practice, it ends up being he's providing cover for the Democratic Party, for people like Lyndon Johnson. And this actually brings me to... Um, Johnson uh, was instituting something called the Great Society Program, which, you know, a series of welfare reforms like Medicare, Medicaid... And it was in part influenced by a book Harrington had written in 1962 called The Other America, which is about poverty in America. And it, it's, it's, a, it's a short book. You can read it in an afternoon. And it's mostly kind of this journalistic, impressionistic account. And it's very well written. But it's in no sense would you call it a socialist or a Marxist view of poverty or, you know, how functions in America. He, he's essentially writing for like these kind of like middle class liberals. And he's essentially saying the federal government hasn't done enough. We need to focus, we need to have a new deal and we need to do it better. And that's what he sees, you know, what he has, Harrington has criticisms of the great society, but he really likes that program and he wants Johnson to do that. And that's essentially what gets him into that camp. And he sees the Vietnam War as a great tragedy, but he's not willing to openly break with the Democrats over that. He doesn't see the Vietnam War as the result of any sort of underlying system of imperialism. It's just kind of like, you know, oh, we people bumbled into it and whatnot. Now, at the same time, this is occurring. Um, Harrington is, he wants to the new left is developing and Harrington really wants to build this kind of realignment coalition with like its more moderate elements in the labor and the student movement in the civil rights movement and to realign the Democrats. Whereas Shackman actually by the late sixties, he is so anti-communist. He is gung ho for the Vietnam war. And he identifies essentially with the labor bureau the AFL-CIO leadership, namely George Meany, who is incredibly racist and anti-communist and very much in favor of the Vietnam War. And Shackman essentially does not want to do the realignment strategy anymore. He just wants to win in Vietnam at any yeah. cost. And he does not want 
to he essentially dismisses the entire new left carte blanche, not just the radicals, but the moderates. He doesn't like them. He and Shackman doesn't like George McGovern, who's you know right. kind of more or less a, a New Deal Democrat. Whereas Harrington really likes George McGovern when that yeah, happened. Yeah, he wrote a whole book. He wrote a book defending him. Although, you know, I think this is really crucial because Shackman is one of these people who keeps showing up in Amer in the history of American politics. Like he's very similar to another person who is in the Workers Party with. Um, uh, so the people don't know when he split when they split with the uh, with the SWP uh, with the SWP, which was the Trotsky party, which Trotsky was, you know. Uh, under James Cannon, right? Mm -hmm. um, Shackman and James Burnham, um, mm. uh, and and Hal Draper, actually. So you you have a mm -hmm. spectrum right there. Um, leave as Shack as Shackmanites. Now, what's interesting is, for example, um, this is such inter Trotskyist uh, stuff that, for most people, doesn't matter anymore. But um, Ted Grant's IMT, for example, accuses, uh, as well as the the people who've become the uh, the uh, Spartacist tendency. So the, the Orthodox Trots, although those two groups of Orthodox Trots also hate each other um, <laughs> for different reasons, and we're not talking about that today. We could do a whole whole series of episodes in the history of Trotsky's party, um, but they Shackman splits, but all the all the all the people who change from the um, degenerated worker state thesis uh, get called Shackmanites, including Tony Cliff, um, who founds the the I the IS tendency. Um, so, but by the late sixties, Shackman, and even through the fifties, because you know Burnham cut so hard with uh, with the Trotskyists by nineteen forty one after he writes the managerial revolution. Um, he wrote some new Machiavellians, which, you know, is like, if you've ever read that book, the last half of it is like, you know, these, these Italian fascist guys aren't that bad. He never misses Mussolini or any of the explicit ones, but it's like Pareto and Michel Robert and all these people who are, you know, explicitly tied to, but anyway, so Burnham goes off and becomes... Uh, recruited by George Kennan to be one of the founding members of the OS of the OSS, um, the with the precursor to the CIA. Um, by the late 1960s, Shackman sounds like Burnham, um, mm -hmm. so much so that Draper's completely gone over to the Cliffite side of things, and eventually will um, go through that and leave the Cliffites because they're not left enough. And Shackman more or less picks up Burnham's tactic because Burnham was part of the, what is it? The Congress for freedom. Um, Congress for cultural freedom. Yeah. It's the Congress for cultural freedom in the 1950s, which was a bunch of former Marxist and some people who said they were still Marxist, mm -hmm. um, hanging out with anti-communist in Europe. And as it's later been outed, but as people had, like, Christopher Lash actually had deduced it before the papers mm -hmm. were even declassified, um, they were CIA front. <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, Shackman picks up some of these people in the late 60s, and the people around Commentary Magazine who become the basis of neoconservatism really do come out of right Shackmanism um, explicitly. Right. Yeah. And weirdly, I know this history, not from my history as a Marxist, but also because all the paleo conservatives that I hung out with in my early 20s also were obsessed with Matt Shackman because they thought that they had corrupted the conservatives. Uh, so so Harrington has bad company in the case of Matt Shackman and the Shackman Harrington split really does put a nail in the coffin. I mean, it, as you're describing, it kills the SPA. You yeah. know, the, a, a pre, I mean, you know, this, the SPA is a very old socialist organization. Um, it's older than a lot of the European Socialist Party, something that most Americans don't even know. Um, like, it, it comes from the, you know, um, it comes when a lot of the European labor and socialist parties were still being formed that the only, the ones that were stronger and more and more, you know, well-formed were in France and in Germany, but a lot of the other ones weren't formed when the, when 
believe it or not, when the SPA was formed. It's that early. And yeah. we they basically kill a living socialist tradition in America. I mean, like it was already kind of dead, let's be honest. It 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 didn't it kind of was destroyed by Wilson and then the popular front kind of one twoing it. Um, but it you know, it it it's it's a big deal that Harrington to me is involved in that. It never completely breaks from it. Now he doesn't embrace the the you know realignment to the let's almost realign with the Republicans in their in their you know conservative mode, um, which is what you see with the realignment strategy in the 70s and 80s. But I think you know it's telling to me that you know um that those anti-communist ideas are thrown throughout the DSA. Now, the DSA now will say, oh, we don't really enforce the democratic centralism ban, um, this, that, and the other, because it's a legacy of anti-communism. But your entire strategy is built, even the confederated nature of the DSA, its charters, is built around a lot of this explicit anti-communism. Mm -hmm. Like... Um, yeah, I just wanted to go off on a rant about Max Chapman because I think like people, if people you're describing like basically Shackman, Shackmanism has three poles mm -hmm. and one of which ends up being like more aligned with the IS Cliffite tradition, one of which ends up being Harringtonism and one of which ends up being neoconservatism. So like right. it's something that's kind of this guy is important to American politics in ways that I don't think a, a lot of people realize. Like he's actually influential in the Reagan administration by proxy. Um, yeah. it, it's it, you're, you're actually really right on that. Uh, the the three-way split, the left, right, and center uh, of Shackmanism. Uh, but what sp starts the split, I think really coming out of the open is after 68, with uh, Nixon coming in, Harrington kind of comes out against the Vietnam War. And I think it's telling that it takes that to happen because it's a Republican in office. And when a Republican's in office, it might be a little easier to come out in opposition. Now, however insincere or what have you that opposition is, it's still opposition, which Shackman, Shackman doesn't want. He wants victory in Vietnam, Harrington is willing to countenance negotiations and um, a, you know, a withdrawal. And eventually this gets so bad that in 1972, during the election, Harrington is supporting uh, George McGovern. And I should say mm -hmm. Harrington is officially one of the leaders, if not at one point, I think they have three leaders in the Socialist Party. But he's the public face of the party. But at the same time, a lot of other people around Max Shackman, they're more or less supporting Richard Nixon. So Harrington eventually resigns and you have the you know, we, we can all make, we all make fun of Trotsky as splits, but here you have the Socialist Party of America more or less splitting over George McGovern versus Richard Nixon. And the Socialist Party itself uh, changes into something called the Social Democrats USA, which, yeah, it's a lot of these kind of neocon types mm -hmm. who, you know, you find them in like a lot of CIA stuff. They're very much involved in like a lot of that. One group which had split a little earlier is now the Socialist Party of the United States. Yep, which is still Party around. Day. Yep. Yeah, that was a fellow traveler of for mm -hmm. many years. And uh, and the third group is the the center one, which is what Harrington forms called the Democratic Socialist Organizing Committee, DASOC. Mm -hmm. and they're formed with a lot of these kind of like New York type intellectuals, people like Irving Howe. A lot of people in like the the United Auto Workers bureaucracy and other trade union bureaucracies, and some moderate people from the from the the New Left, and this is they form around 1973. And one thing that they do throughout a lot of the 70s is they're very much involved in Democratic Party politics to try and actually do realignment, and they push something called the Democratic Agenda, which is basically a New Deal great societies type program that I, I believe Carter officially adopts in the election. And Harrington is very ecstatic over this. And when Carter's elected, as, as you said much earlier, well, neoliberalism kind of starts under Carter. All that democratic agenda stuff kind of goes by the wayside. 
Harrington himself is very heartbroken about this. He's involved with some of these uh, labor bureaucrats who put up a tepid opposition called the Progressive Alliance, which really doesn't do anything and kind of goes by the wayside. But Harrington actually, uh, he supports Ted Kennedy in 1980 as the primary challenger to uh, Carter, but actually- AOC's support... protege. Anyway, yep. I mean, AOC's it, uh, mentor. mentor. That's yeah. right. Um, and, uh, but he doesn't actually support Carter in that election. Uh, now to get to the formation of uh, the DSA is, DASOC is one component. The other component is something called the New American Movement which was initially kind of like this supporting third world liberation struggles. They come out of SDS. They're very influenced by Marxism, Leninism, but also Gramsci, but they kind of me mellow out during the seventies. They get involved in democratic party politics. They get, you know, they're very much, uh, and they start working closely with the day sock members and they kind of have to get over some hurdles on Israel because Nam's position was a little more supportive of like the Palestinians. They kind of get over that and they, they fuse in uh, about 1982 or so. And Harrington is the recognized leader of uh, DSA, the Democratic Socialists of America. And they are also actually by that time, both DASOC and DSA are members of the Socialist International. They are the American section. So along with like the French Socialist Party or the Israeli Labor Party. They're all members. And DSA is actually, I believe it, by the 80s, it's the largest uh, group on the American left. I might, maybe the Communist Party is officially larger, but DSA is certainly up there. I was to say, they all, it was one of those like, saying that we still need to talk about how big it was because it hit about 5,000 and like, yeah, it never got above that. And so no. it was, it, um, the American left at the time, um, in the eighties is a much different beast than it had even been like, you know, uh, during the seventies, like during the high day of the new communist movement, this is just a new communist movement. This is not even including the Trotskyists because all the new right. communists are Maoist and Hojist or whatever. Um, they're split up over so many different organizations that I think there was probably like a half mil of them easy. Um, but they're split up over something like 72 different orgs. Um, uh, there's a Max Elbaum's book on this goes into mm -hmm. this. Like they're so, they're so divided. Um, but they're, they, they could have been a huge movement, um, at the time, but they also, no one really finds out what happens to all these people or where are they going, where they're mellowing out and joining these more social democratic or just flat out democratic group. The, the, the amount of people in your, in the government, um, from David Horowitz to Rob Reich, as I mentioned, who had new communist, you know, out of the end, out of the heyday of SDS, when SDS went from kind of a liberal organization, it was founded basically by, by, by a vague socialist and a, and a vague libertarian even into a bunch of splinter Maoist groups. I mean, you know, at one point, like the central committee is half run by the RCP of the SDS. I mean, like, but you know, the, 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 the Avakian group before Avakian was actually in charge. Um, and, but so in the seventies, like these groups disintegrate, but like, and no one really even asked where they went. I mean, you know, in fact, um, Lash was talking about how they were beginning to already die off, uh, you know, um, by the time Nixon ended, you know, was ramping down the war in Vietnam, they had no, and that's early, early seventies. So they have nowhere to go. Um, mm -hmm. And so a lot of them become Democrats. Some of them become prominent Republicans. I've mentioned David Horowitz several times. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> um, you know, some of them become like almost foaming at the mouth Republicans. But um, the this disintegration is interesting to me. And what I also find interesting from the standpoint of history is if you did ask someone in 1929 which party was going to have more progressives come out of it, uh, the the Democrats are the Republicans. I think most people probably would assume the Republicans. I mean, it took, it took um, one whole election cycle for the black vote to, to, to start supporting FDR. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, 
the, the 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 fact that this seems obvious oh the party of the new deal or whatever seems obvious to us doesn't necessarily to me and the fact that you brought up that Harrington was an Irish Catholic of 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 some prominent family background would have indicated to me that he grew up around de democratic part politics before it was even mm -hmm. progressive because you know that was the party of of the Irish Catholic um political machines in the northeast and in the midwest so you know, I just I find this fascinating because um, I think Harrington's part of why everyone thinks that aligning with the Democrats um, makes sense. Now, it does kind of now if you have to pick a party. But as anyone who studied the history of labor parties know, the U.S. is almost. It's not unique in this regard. Um, if you study like the Middle East, actually, the, the, uh, my friend. Um, Gene likes to point out that the American politics is a lot more like Middle Eastern politics in this regard. But like, we never developed a labor party. We had yeah. two different, arguably the Democrats isn't even a bourgeois party. They're like a proto bourgeois party or like an early bourgeois party, something like that. Because, you know, they emerge with the, you know, they're the oldest. The Democratic Party is like, I think the oldest membership uh, the oldest voter membership-based political party in existence. Um, so what does that mean? Well, there are parties that are older, but you you didn't join them as a voter. You joined them as a legislature, um, like, you know, the old Tories or whatever. But the idea of you identifying with a party as a voter, um, I think the Democrats are the oldest one on the planet because they they're... You know, one of the oldest European parties, for example, is the SPD in Germany. Um, and the Democrats are almost a uh, hundred years older than them. So um, at the, the Republican Party is, you know, is not that old. I mean, the Republican Party begins with Lincoln. The Whigs were the Whigs were probably not ever really a party like we think of it anyway. Um, so. It comes from the Democratic Party comes from a time in a coalition that's that's just frankly very very different. I mean, if you look in the in the 18th century and 19th century, the Democrats are on the side of yeoman farmers, decentralization. Um, they're kind of populist the entire time, but their their class base is weird and always has been, um, and I think is now. I mean, if you look at you look at uh, the democratic voter base for example it's the richest and the poorest people in america mm -hmm. it's not like um the i mean yes a lot of the very extreme extreme rich are republicans but like if you're just looking at your quartiles like like you know a lot of the quote one percent unquote are democrats um yeah so it doesn't seem natural to me from the standpoint of of before FDR and and before and before Johnson and before the realignment attempt that we would have tried to you know um be join the democrats because the democrats had segregationist in them until the end of nixon like mm -hmm. this is something that i think like this is something that is kind of avoided when they're talking about how much you're having to shield here because you know, well, one of the things that you I like to talk about is like during the, the civil rights movement, um, Johnson's making deals, you know, for civil rights, but also w w not necessarily let black representatives of the Democratic Party sit right. um, it, at, at caucus meetings and stuff um, because they're still a segregated party and they're still they still got to keep Th Strom Thurmond from leaving. Mm -hmm. you know? Um. And I like to point out, by the way, that Joe Biden likes to talk about his early days in, in this in the Senate when this was still going on and like humanized Strom Thurmond. This is I've actually um, watched him do this like in person. <laughs> like I I went to a speech in 2017 um, that he was that he gave, and he went he he did this weird thing. We're talking about like you know fighting Trump and whatever, and he talks about national healing, and then he talked about like how Strom Thurmond adopted a disabled kid and 
and this, that, and the other, and having to make compromises, and you're just like, what? Like, and this was not, this is not like 90s Biden. This is 2017 anti-Trump Biden. So, you know, I, that legacy is still in the Democratic Party. Um, I think pretty actively, actually, particularly when you deal with like the Southern political machines in the Democratic Party um, and some of that politics. Um, <sighs> So, you know, I guess this is my way of saying, like, um, it doesn't seem to me, it seems to me like part of why the Democratic Party is why we think the party we have to manipulate is because, A, you can't imagine socialists being able to work with Republicans at this point. But B, um, Harrington's part of that legacy in a very real and pronounced way. Yeah. Um and in a way that I think has put, I mean, people need to also understand about labor bureaucracy because um, they might not get what we're talking about here because they're so used to this time where there's no unions. But labor bureaucracy was active in suppressing um, strikes and labor militancy until a bunch of Rylecock strikes happened in the 70s. And after that, neoliberalism is partly prompted by the fact that a lot of people resent labor bureaucratic leadership, which by this point is beginning to be paid in stock options. It's completely separate from the workers. You have the professionalization of it um, the, as a separate organization of professional organizers who are completely, you know, they often have never worked in the workplaces they represent. You start seeing the beginnings in the 19 and this time period of non-oppositional bargaining, and, and uh, which is now de rigueur in the labor movement. Etc. So when we're talking about labor bureaucracy, we're not talking about, you know, even Jimmy Hoffa. We're talking about like people who are professional politicos who probably have been working for unions as, quote, organizers or are, are negotiators or are, um, whatever their entire life. Um, and often had positions to the right of their membership and to the right even of the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so I wanted to just say a few things. I actually made a joke one point about realigning the Republican Party. <laughs> First of all, Marx and Engels had supported Lincoln and early German Marxists had actually campaigned for Lincoln. There's a history of progressivism in the Republican Party. Look at Teddy Roosevelt and this kind of populism in there. And ironically, I've seen people like actually advocate that seriously. I was just kidding. Um, but in terms of Harrington, uh, you're right. His family was very Democrat. His grandfather uh, was on his deathbed in 1944 and demanded to be rolled out to, the, to, to vote for FDR. And one of Harrington's actually early signs of rebellion was becoming a Taft Republican in like uh, 1946 or eight or something. He, he drops that, but that was like a sign of, uh, for him, you know, that it was, it was in his blood almost to be, to be a Democrat. And, uh, but yeah, the big shift, I think with the Democrats becoming what we see them now is first the new deal and like the rise of like mass unionization which and the really popular did, front. The popular front, of course. And, you know, the 60s with civil rights and essentially the, the change up between the two parties a bit, you know, Nixon's Southern strategy, and the Democrats are able to capture in the aftermath of the 60s movements, like a lot of like its more moderate members, you know, a lot of people who were active in the civil rights movement, a lot of activists ended up being Democratic Party politicians. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the Maoists, um, you know, like you said, they were a huge thing in the in the 70s. Obviously, you have like China's really crappy foreign policy that alienates a lot of people, the death of Mao, and just kind of like the dissipation of radical energy. So by like the 80s, most of these parties, there's a few exceptions, are, are essentially liquidated into the Jesse Jackson campaign. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
you know, they they become social democrats, if not just upright outright democrats. But I've always been I've always been fascinated by the fact that the in and Harrington's involved in all three of these cycles. Um, that after that after um, the end of uh, World War II largesse, that basically you see these cycles of social democrats trying to shift the 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 party they lose and then a right-wing faction of the party actually benefits from the energy brought in by the social democratic faction i am thinking here of the fact of the way that the um the you know the uh the the new democrats of the of the dnc um and obviously the clintons but also like mm-hmm. gary hart and all those people really benefit from the energy of the Jesse Jackson campaign, yes. but have a diametrically opposed politics. And I think we've seen something similar with Biden, where essentially what you have is mo- like the appearance of movement, but it creates actually enough stasis to revitalize the center. And it's happened more than once. This is not the first time it's happened. Like, this is what I find so fascinating. Like, you can, you can. And you, I think you see that with the response to the McGovern campaign. I think you see that in response to the Jesse Jackson campaign. I mean, yes, Carter is a progressive now, but even at like you know at the time of his election, not just on, not just because of neoliberalization and the end of profitability. I mean, I don't think it was just political will on Carter's part, actually, but like also he was tied to evangelicals. He was this you know he was this weird you know non not particularly racist, moderate, religious person from Georgia. That is not at the time going to be seen as like the leader of the progressive movement by any stretch of the imagination. And yet the failure of Humphrey, uh, of um, a McGovern and the energy, however, that the McGovern campaign generated in addition to um, Gerald Ford, just discrediting himself um does seem to be part of how Carter ended up in the White House in the first place. And similarly, um, you know, by trying to manipulate Ted Kennedy, it actually kind of helps Reagan. Mm-hmm. You know, these things are... And so I think they learned the lesson about, well, if we try to push someone more progressive, we'll help Reagan. <laughs> but they don't learn the lesson of, hey, by investing all this energy into the Democratic Party, often right-wing elements within the party are able to more benefit from this movement than we are. Um, I mean, I, I really feel that's what we're like, what we're seeing right now that like, even with, um, uh, Corey black and uh, Talib, who, I mean, I, I actually kind of of the squad Talib is the one I actually kind of have a soft spot for, um, uh, with AOC, um, Etc. That I think that that Ted Kennedy DNA is there, um, you know, to the core, and that we forget that the people that we complain about as a Democratic rightist now were in the '80s the people who were the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. Um, you know, some super corrupt old. You know, old, I don't want to call someone a dinosaur for fear of being ageist, but like Diane Fanstein has been involved in, you know, in politics forever. But, you know, going back to the Harvey Milk campaign, you find her. And yet she's one of the most right wing Democrats we have. We have that whole trend in California. Um, the D- I don't see why the DSA thinks that they're going to be that much different. We've had similar movements before. I mean, we keep on bringing up the SDS, but I think the SDS is a really good correlate to what the DSA is right now. Yeah, I mean, what's also interesting, though, um, in terms of the Jesse Jackson campaign, Harrington actually doesn't back the 1984 one. He is just gung-ho for Walter Mondale. Oh, God. I'm not kidding. It, it was a, it was a, and it, even though that campaign was probably in Harrington's lifetime the the best chance for realignment or the most clear one, you know, in terms of 
mobilizing a coalition that Harrington would have supported, domestic and far, foreign policy positions that were to the left of the Democratic center. It's only, he does support Jackson in 88, um, but Jackson is kind of moderated a little bit by then. And Harrington's not the best health, actually. He dies a year later. But you're right. There is like, a, it seems like when people get like energized about a progressive or more lefty challenger within the Democrats, the party structures are not set up so that that person is going to win. That energy just gets absorbed and used by, um, you know, for new phone bankers, for new, for the apparatus. And you're right, like after 84 and the campaign, like the Democrats are like, you know, we got to be more pro-business. We've got to stop talking about this new deal stuff. This, you know, you see stuff like the, the Democratic Leadership Council and everything that really is taking leadership or uh, really kind of pushing down even like the rhetoric of the new deal even if they have no intention of actually implementing it. They want to be more like Republicans. Like I actually have joked before that, you know, Joe Biden, I guess we're going to see the possibilities of a Mondale administration or, or Dukakis. Yeah. Cause I mean, he's that, kind of like the, the kind of Democrat that he is, right. Is this, yeah. this, this pre, I mean, in some ways, in some ways it is interesting. I mean, because I, I think people underestimate how much Obama, despite the, you know, opposing the Clintons was a product of that attitude. I think you see that immediately in his cabinet. Um, like he, you know, he appointed basically Clinton people across the board, basically old D Democratic Leadership Council, current DNC people across the board. And you actually don't see that with Biden. Um, and I think partly because Biden knows that, you know, that they're not going to survive another round. I mean, Basically, they're being saved right now by chaos in the Republicans. Like they're not. It's not like the, the Democrats are broadly popular. It's that the Republicans are broadly unpopular. Um, now, what I find fascinating about this is that um, even right now, if I was to ask you who is the most powerful Democrat in the Senate, who would you say? Maybe Schumer? Probably Schumer, and then directly after him, the most conservative Democrat in the entire Senate, Tim Manchin. Why? Because all Tim has to do is not vote to stop even Bernie yeah. Sanders' reconciliation process from being able to be invoked. So the furthest, the, the most furthest right Democrat is the person you have to convince on everything. Mm -hmm. And that was also true when they had a lot, like when Obama had a supermajority, when people tend to forget how big a deal that was, that no party had had that much control of the government ever. Uh, not ever, actually, since the 60s. But, like, in our lifetime. Like, the Republicans never did. And the Democrats blew it in a year. Mm -hmm. um, and then proceeded to blame the Republicans for why they blew it, you know, as if space-time ran backwards. Um, you know, like when I said that uh, Ted Kennedy was AOC's protege, um, but it is, it does seem to me like this, this is a similar trend that we see right now. And the policies of the Democrats um, are going to feel anemic. I mean, even, you know, when I'm hearing people celebrating the fact we're going to finally get fight for 15 and I'm like, yeah, but that was something that made sense. In most, in most states, almost ten years ago, right? Like, you've had two percent inflation every year since then. Mm -hmm. Like, so you're asking, like, this is literally like Biden's, like, okay, I'm going to give you like the demands for when Barack Obama was president and the Republicans took over. You might get some of that, although not single payer because no, but. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm talking about Medicare for all. Um, and I really do think your book does talk, explain how Harrington's legacy ties into this and how, despite the, the fact that most, you're right, most DSAers are not Harringtonites, the dirty split is not a Harringtonite thing. The dirty split's also not viable. 
because the political operatives in in you know not just we're talking about the fact that the squad and them do not actually work that way the political operatives within the democratic party also know you're going to try to do it you've announced it and made it public how do you have a dirty split to a party you're canvassing for when you have at a caucus said in public that you're hoping to destroy that party it's just an unviable and unrealistic thing. It really, like you, like if you were to actually do it, even your membership shouldn't know. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, like I said, I think it's one of those things you talk about during the off-year election where you can maybe afford to be a little more lefty sounding, but in practice, it's like th th it's not going to happen. You're right. Everyone knows. And also, it really assumes the Democrats are, frankly, going to be clueless about the whole thing. But when, like you said, it's been announced. And that's assuming it's actually serious, which it's not. Right. I mean, that's why the Democrats don't care, right? I mean, otherwise, like, AOC would be truly persona non grata. And they smacked her around with some committee things and then kind of reinstated them just to, be, to remind her her place. And she seems to have learned it. Yeah. Um, you know, and... I admit, AOC is one of the most uh, media-savvy Democrats we've seen in a long mm -hmm. time. Um, I was watching, the, I, I was a masochist about two weeks ago and watching the House, or three weeks ago, watching the House deliberations on uh, <laughs> on uh, on the impeachment of Donald Trump. Um, and I was amazed at how someone as sleazy and not got great at speaking as Ted Cruz could talk around these ancient Democrats who all seem to be like septuagenarians. Um, and so then I was like, oh, no wonder AOC makes sense because so many and all the squad people make sense because like Cory Booker seems like a brush of fresh air when you see that. Like... Um, you know, the California neoliberal Democrats seem like a brush of fresh air when you actually watch the Democrats in Congress. And yet, we haven't done anything about that. You know, um, there's there, there's very little to see that, that that's going to happen. And also, I haven't, has, has a DSA or one um, national prominence in a red state yet? I don't uh, think so. I don't they think have so some, either. They've had some city victories in blue states. Yes. In blue cities and red states. But I haven't seen any... You haven't seen them bring any map to the table that wasn't already democratically held. And if you want to really put the Democrats' feet to the fire, that's the strategy you'd have to have. But I don't see how... the how In the areas where the, where the, where the DSA um, is more radical, they have no strategy to do that. And right. no opportunity to do it either. Not, the, and, and I don't think it would work, by the way. But like, yeah, like, I, I know if, what you mean. The but other thing, if you were going to play this game, that's what you'd have to do. Right. The other thing you'd also have to do is, uh, if this is actually a viable strategy, you need to hold the various politicians accountable to you and you know your organization. Which, as far as I know, like, has anyone done anything? hold AOC accountable for some of her things or any of these other DSA politicians? I don't think so. I think I heard once about someone in Chicago they wanted to censure or expel, but that's kind of it. The rest of them who are in the Democrat Party, you know, just go about your merry way. And you're right about AOC. She's incredibly media savvy. She's incredibly charismatic, you know, whether on Instagram, Twitter, just her interviews. And it's almost like I... I it's almost like in a weird way, it's like the Democrat party is like the, the late Soviet communist party with like all these like really old people in it, you know, not to say anything bad about older people. But you is know what basically I mean. Gorby. Gorbachev just, uh, <laughs> just way, which is way easier on the eyes, but I mean like, <laughs> like, like AOC, AOC is, I mean, seriously, because Gorbachev who, who I think people don't, under, because we always think of Gorbachev as, as you know, post perestroika but like yeah he was the young new blood yeah and and he was savvy and actually compared to some of the people he was replacing 
an okay Soviet leader. I mean, not like not. I don't think it's super great, but when you can play, compare him to late Brezhnev, like <laughs> uh, it's just like you know. So y- yes, it ultimately still failed, and I, I like one of the things I've, I'm thinking about the dirty break. I used to, I used to, you know, I I, I was um, friends um, with Michael Brooks, and I would always ask Michael Brooks, "When are you actually going to do it? When would you not? When would the dirty break not risk putting Republicans in power?" Mm-hmm. I cannot, literally, cannot think. And you would have to defeat the Republicans, not just like in the Senate. You'd have to defeat them on a state level in a way that I've seen you guys have, no, and our, or even the DNC have no strategy to do because the DNC sometimes seems to barely care about local politics, even in these states that went that voted blue um, in the Biden administration, like Georgia and a lot of other ones. The Republicans are still drawing up the the maps. Like they they the, the the victory is kind of pyrrhic because they didn't focus on the states and in a lot of those states um the vote was clearly against Trump because they still voted down ballot for Republicans at the state level. How how is that a victory? Mm-hmm. I mean it is a victory but like it's 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 a really weird one. And it's just and if you think about the long-term viability of the Democratic Party to be anything of a party but except for like California, San, uh, California, um, C, um, Washington, Oregon, New England, and a, a few of the Rust Belt states that can flip at any moment because the Democratic Party's um, working class base is precarious um what what have they really done i mean like how, how how it doesn't seem like much has changed um and and thus i do get some of these weird opportunists and these post leftists who are like maybe we should try realignment but with the republican party i think that's insane i think that's reactionary inherently um given what you'd be playing with now and it's a it's an even worse kind of popular populism and inheritanism but I get why someone could come to that conclusion when you're like, well, the Democrats don't seem to care about state level politics outside of the states they run. And even if you look at California, it looks like Newsom may have a hard time of it soon. Mm-hmm. Um, so what should we do? How can why can't any social like one of the things we're the sectarian socialists were useless and largely not tied to power but they could been they could be more disciplined about stuff like this and we don't seem to be able to no. like if if i was an anti like the reason why i don't join the dsa is i was an, if i'm an anti electoralist in the dsa like okay i don't personally canvas you're not making me but i'm still giving money to the national and yeah. they're going to be paying people to canvas and that even if they're not directly giving money over to, to the democratic party and lobbying which frankly may be more effective than just canvassing for them um they're not like what are they really getting for it like like how many um how many centrist right right centrist democrats can the dsa on seat they might be able to unseat a few but i don't think ultimately i th- in a way, in like some kind of qualitative way that it's going to really make a difference, honestly. Like AOC come, ran in New York, which is very blue state. You know, it's always had like a history of like left Democrats being able to win in certain districts there. Mm-hmm. And they seem to have this vision like that they're just going to keep growing, that they're going to keep electing people and eventually, well, it's like, you know, doesn't quite work that way. Sometimes things retract, you know, people can lose elections and, you know, the reality of being involved in that party to stay in it, you have to do party things. You're going to have to make deals with these people. And I wanted to touch on something you'd actually brought up about some of these post left people and about, you know, why, you know, realigning the Republican party. There's like been an interesting phenomenon within, you know, since Trump has got in, uh, about uh, people who are so disgusted with Clinton and the Democrats, a lot for reason, you know, good reasons, but they seem to think the Democrats are so bad and they see Trump and the Republicans as almost like 
you know, Trump is being like this anti-establishment figure. And in certain ways he is, he was at loggerheads with sections of the bourgeoisie. Uh, but they, you know, they were willing to like get in line with Trump and like these kind of right wing populist crowds, like that see him as like disrupting the system in a way. It, it, it struck me as like either an accelerationist argument or a nihilistic one, you know, at best, but mostly just like just a, a reactionary one ultimately. And, uh, you know, like the Socialist Workers Party, which no longer is Trotsky is, was courting like a lot of these Trump folks recently. Uh, you have a former Maoist philosopher named Bill Barton, who is like just gung ho for Trump. It's, it's just kind of amazing. You know, so you have like this, this strange yeah, phenomenon. He was, uh, tied, he was informally tied to Kasama project and went back to the RCP. Yeah. I actually, uh, I knew a, an Occupy friend of mine who was a, a co-editor with me, a secret co-editor with me at the North Star who became a diehard Trumpist and actually funded some, some right wing uh, publications, I believe. Wow. Um, and I know some of these people, like I know Bill Martin, but I get why, I get why they're going that way. I do too. It's I just mean, a... it actually, it, it makes sense as like a, a metabolic response, but it's another kind of opportunism, right? Like, oh, absolutely. And it all, you also have to just deny certain things to, yeah. to go that <laughs> way. I mean, it reminds me of the, well, frankly, of a lot of the social Democrats in Italy who were either who became the core of left fascism, which which unfortunately, because we tend to focus on Germany, we don't deal like in Strasserism. Yeah, right. Things thrown around. But the Strasserists were workerists, sure, but they were never left. They were not part of. the. Well, actually, some of them were part of the SPD, but like the in the main they were not from the mainline marxist parties but when in the case of the italian fascists a lot of those people were not just mussolini who's the most famous example and obviously the leader but like a lot of those people became more and more enamored with the appearance of movement um and you know you know the fascist thing before we started before it became the mint you know what it means now was corporatism and Americans, when they hear corporatism, think rule by corporations, I'm like, no, that's just capitalism, bro. Like corporatism <laughs> is the corporate nature of classes in collaboration for a unified totality of the state. Like, so it's, it is class co to uh, collaborationists. And I wonder, you know, when I, when I see some of these, uh, um, post leftists, I don't like. I don't think they're fascist in the classical sense. I don't think all of them are racist, but a lot of them are class collaborationists, and they think we should be siding with the petit bourgeois. Um, you know, because of the professional managerial class or whatever. Um, and also, you'll notice a lot of their theories are infused with Shackmanism and. Burnhamism and and dropping out, um, frankly, that that Burnham like Burnham hard broke with the Marxist left. He mm -hmm. was like it was he was not just an anti-communist, he was an anti-Marxist. Um, it's hard to yes, I know Makuza also worked for the OSS. Um, it's, uh. The, the Frankfurt School's relationship to the CIA is actually greatly overstated, but in the case of Marcuse and Franz Newman, it, it was true that they were yeah. hired in the anti-fascist division um, in the late 40s and the 50s. Um, but um, the great majority of the people in the OSS were right-wingers, and then a lot of people like Irving Howe were also explicit anti-communists, and they were on the take. Like... Mm -hmm. Um, and now it's now it's proven like th these records are now public record. So it's it's not even a matter of conjecture like it was when Christopher Lash was writing about it. So it's. I think we should hold this stuff very, very suspiciously. Do I think that the DSA as a CA front? I'm sure some, you know, some Internet Stalinist will say such a thing. Um, or Marxist Leninists, let me call them by the name they want to be called by whatever, because they get mad at me. Um, I don't really care, but. Um, 
I'm sure that Stash Twitter will will probably, you know, say that the DSA is a CIA front. I don't think that, but no. I, I don't think that at all. In fact, I don't think they're that important, um, frankly. Um, I don't think any, I mean, not, not just the DSA, I don't think anyone on the left is actually that important. They don't need to corral us in the same way anymore. But um, I do think it's interesting that that DNA is there. And that it's that it's not totally dealt with. Yes, I when I you know people in the know and like Sunkar and stuff, they'll they'll kind of have your cake and eat it too in their relation to Harrington and Harringtonism, and they'll point out you know they'll they'll point out Austro Marxism. I mean, um, I mean you know Boschkar will even pull out Mac McNair at times and and the Marxist Center and you know, with relations to Sam Marcy, but it all seems to be obscuring the fact that at the end of the day, um, they don't feel like they can oppose the Democrats in any real and significant way other than from within. And so far, we've never had any evidence that that works. And sometimes it seems to actually make things worse. Yeah. Oh, I agree. And uh, like I've, I've watched interviews with Sankara and it's kind of interesting. He kind of, in some of them, like he makes out like, they're trying to create this tradition uh, when he's talking about like uh, the creation of Jacobin and you know, the, the left that came out of that, like it really wasn't something that actually happened ex Nilo. Like he was drawing on people like Howe and Harrington and with Sankara, it's very explicit. Like he says it, you know, to his credit, I, I appreciate people who are upfront about that. Yeah. I, I actually and, will get Sankara some credit for being kind of honest actually about most yeah. of the stuff. <laughs> and I also wanted to just touch on something. Uh, I know that you and um, my, my good friend Shallon are working on a, a book on Lash. And actually my first encounter with Lash was actually researching about Harrington because I found uh, Lash, Lash's uh, review of Towards a Democratic Left, which I just thought was a brilliant like takedown of Harrington and eventually read the whole book that that was, uh, it was part of a collection of essays called agony of the American left, which, which I uh, think is a brilliant, I loved it. I loved book. the book. I thought it was brilliant. Like uh, the stuff on like, uh, you know, the cultural cold war, which I also just thought was just, uh, just an in general critique of American intellectuals, just bowing down to the powers that be, I just thought was incredible. You know, and he's got stuff on there, of course, on black nationalism, on populism, on urban, early American socialism. I thought it was just a great read. And uh, I, I normally do don't. It's funny how many people who are anti identity politics ignore what he has to say about black nationalism. Yeah. But anyway, um, go ahead. No, so I just wanted to bring that up just because uh, you know, that was my encounter with Leish. And I normally don't read most books like in one sitting. And I did with uh, with the, the Magony, the American left. And it's also about James Burnham. I, I, I did some research on him for the, the Harrington. I didn't include most of it, but he wasn't just anti-Marxist and anti-communist. He was one of the founders and editors of National Review with Bill Buckley. Buckley loved the guy. Oh, yeah. And, you know, he he was, you're right, he had pretty much the same position as uh, Shackman on Vietnam, although Burnham was also, like, pro-apartheid and, and all this. He wanted, like, oh, preemptive yeah. nuclear war <laughs> on the Soviet Union. Pro Burnham Burnham is almost, like, he could be a character in Dr. Strangelove by, by the <laughs> 1950s. I mean, yeah. Like, um, but the thing is, Irving Howe and people like that in the 50s were willing to hang out with him. Um, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, like if you read Burnham's politics are also, uh, you know, uh, J uh, Orwell wrote a lot about Burnham. In fact, um, interestingly, Orwell's, um, Goldstein character, um, in, uh, who is a proxy for Trotsky, a mm -hmm. lot of what he actually says is the inner theory of the party is actually right. James Burnham, not Trotsky. Um, but, Orwell calls Burnham out for basically saying that, like, oh, your response to the managerialism of the fascist is if you can't beat them, do the same thing as them, but better. Yes. Um, which, if you read later on with Burnham stuff, that is eff eff effectively what he was arguing, because he wanted a managerial elite to emerge out of the military. Um, 
and basically he does call the rise of Eisenhower, and then that never happens again. Burnham's just completely wrong, and he's kind of and like he Eisenhower's too moderate for him, and you know, like too against the military industrial complex, which is all hilarious um, from the standpoint of uh, uh, of history. But yeah, the fact that that Max Shackman isn't that far removed from that, and that that that. That um, because Burnham's interesting. He's the founder of both paleoconservatism in some ways and neoconservatism. But Shackman's right wing joins up with the Burnhamites eventually. Um, and with this post left, a lot of Burnham's class theory is actually what's driving their theories. It's just it's been rebranded as PMC and not the managerial class. Um, so. You know, I think that's interesting, and I think it's uh, I think it's kind of damning. Um, and it doesn't surprise me now that a lot of people frustrated from you know, like the Class Unity Caucus in the in the DSA, whose politics I actually I think are not terrible for Social Democrats, but you can see how that's one step removed from you know, left-right opportunism when you get too pissed off at people yelling at Adolf Reed. I mean, you you definitely see it. You you start seeing, like, PMCs, you know, PMCs that are primary enemy, not the not the bourgeoisie, and the PMCs run the left, and this, and, and it becomes a structural, a structural conspiracy theory, actually, um, instead of class analysis. Um, and I think we're going to see a lot more of this. I think one of the things that the DSA kind of covers is there's a lot more of the left and maybe the general culture has moved slightly left, although I have actually yet to see a whole lot of evidence for that, except on social issues. Um, but that the left has actually moved right. The entire left has actually moved right in response. Because um, we've all been responding to the DSA. I mean, even for example, uh, Maoist. Let's talk about Maoist for a second. Maoist in, in pre nineteen pre Trump were almost unilaterally opposed to currently existing China. Now you can't find that many Maoist groups that'll say anything bad about Xi. <laughs> I mean, like that's weird. That's that, that's that's weird. I mean, like, because G is so in terms of policy, not in terms of anti-imperial posturing, but in terms of actual like policy, hasn't even delivered on the social reforms of Hu Jintao, like, which were just democratic. I mean, people don't even understand that. Like, China barely has a democratic, like, it doesn't even really have truly socialist medicine. <laughs> like, like, it, in some ways, Sweden is is more effectively socialist in other ways it's completely not i mean the chinese state does technically own like 60 percent of all businesses but then they still operate in a private market um why is this controversial to say on the left well it's because we've all kind of moved opportunistically to a more right wing place and people who haven't are increasingly kind of alienated or they're you know, they're not even Trotskyists anymore. You have to go to, like, you know, um, people trying to revive ultra-left tendencies to to go in a different direction, I think. Yeah. So, in terms of Maoism, you also have, not quite related to China, but um, Baba Vakian, uh, who endorsed Joe Biden last time, which... Uh, he was one of the holdouts from the the new communist movement who did who did not capitulate in the 80s he just had his own cult until i guess he found biden you faded out for a second Can oh you, i'm sorry uh, i was say what you're saying i was saying uh bob avakian who endorsed joe biden in that, oh, yeah. it, this, this last oh, round yeah. uh so you have that but i actually have said before that the last two election campaigns especially have been for at least this isn't for the maoists but for uh uh, Trotsky, it's, it's been like the Jesse Jackson moment, just as like the new communist movement, essentially its last gasp was, you know, 84, 88, when they all went away. This last two election cycles, like the socialist alternative who has Shama Sawant as like their city council person out in Seattle, 
they went real hard for Sanders in uh, 2016 and, you know, the last time. And ISO essentially imploded over that, in part over the Sanders campaign and the growth of the DSA. You know, if you're going to, why be like a half-assed opportunist if you can join the larger group like DSA and put in your full ass and be an opportunist? You know, and... Uh, and like, also, you know, if you're publishing, uh, if you have a press... You can publish a lot more stuff without having to worry about a Trotsky's party line, perhaps. Sure, but, sure. I mean, um, and you know, there there is a way in which in which the DSA's tendrils are. I mean, I make it sound like they're a conspiracy, but there's a way in which, like <laughs> sure. that that milieu has taken over every major left wing press, to some degree, including mine, um, frankly. Um, to some degree, um, to where it's hard to publish a book critical of Michael Harrington, even if most of DSA is theoretically critical of most of what Michael Harrington stands for. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, uh, I mean, I mean, thankfully, I have a publisher, although it was a, a little more difficult to find one for this than a 19th century insurrectionist, which was kind of funny. Uh, but yeah, it's like, uh, if you go like Verso, which is over the years, it's published some good stuff. I have an earlier book, like Armed Insurrection. It's like a, a manual from the Communist International. And what's one of their best sellers now? It's um, Bigger Than Bernie. Or How to Be an Anti-Capitalist in the 21st Century, which is just a terribly opportunist book. Yeah, it, it is. I will defend Eric Owen Wright on many things, but that book is not great. Uh <laughs> Uh, from everything I know, he sound he sounded like like genuinely nice and wonderful human being. But I I read that book. I'm like, this is terrible. How could anyone like this? And I felt bad on the certain level because I know it was his last one of his last books because he was very ill. But uh, yeah, yeah that, but that's determining like you know in terms of like uh, what's it out there in like lefty culture. That's the stuff that's like getting promoted now. It's not. Um, it's not you know, the Trotsky's or the, or like the Lenin or, or any kind of ultra leftism. It's that kind of stuff. And, uh, even, yeah, in I mean, you saw a revival of ultra leftism after Occupy and even in stuff like communization theory being mm -hmm. popularized and you wouldn't know it. Like you wouldn't know any of that existed, um, mm -hmm. that it faded within three years. Um, so what do you do? What do you do? I mean, I, I have noticed a lot of people who were die hard against Democrats. And, and, and I don't just mean from a DSA standpoint, from, you know, become real soft in the last year. And I think and I, I actually think the post left that we were talking about it makes it harder because it becomes harder to critique the Democrats in good faith because these other people who are now counter posturing, you know, as. It reminds me of like Counterpunch. You remember Counterpunch? I mean, they're oh, still yeah. around, and they could they could do work. They could do work. Ah, they do good work actually now. But in yeah. the in the late aughts, where when Cockburn was still alive, when they were like, well, we can work with paleo conservatives and and stuff to fight to fight the neoliberal center, you know, and you know, it was basically Maoist Alex Jones thought. Um, and how did that work out for everybody? Like, so I mean, I do feel like a lot of the a lot of the the left opposition and the ultra left, and you know, people that you and I are somewhat an independent reactors to, right? Like, I think us both coming out of that yeah. tradition, also not quite being of it. Um, in my case, like, I'm not I'm not a Bordigast in any, but I, I I'm informed by that by the history of Trotskyism. I'm informed by the history of the left wing of Maoism. Like I know it pretty well. Yeah. Um, um, and I feel like there's not a whole lot of place for us anymore. Weirdly. Like, like, you know, I don't, I wouldn't know what organization I could possibly join where I would have anything like even a tendency to represent me. <laughs> I, I share that frustration. I mean, I have, I, I sometimes feel like, okay, I, like, I, I guess I, does, is this like when the, you split so much as a Trotskyist, you're just down to one and you can't do it anymore? 
because yeah, I see, I've seen the same thing. Friends of mine who a few years ago who were like, let's uh, have fake, like on election day, let's have a, a demonstration where we have people throw their ballots in fake toilets and stuff to show what it means. I mean, it's kind of a little silly and street theater, but whatever. But now we're like, you know, what are the possibilities for us under Joe Biden and everything? It's just been an incredibly shift to the, to the right. And it's very alienating and frustrating for pe you know, people, so people I've known for a long time who just have just completely shifted. And I feel like, Am I nuts or am I just like uh, just staying where I am or, or what have you? And it, it's tough to find a place. I mean, you know, I write for who will take my pieces and, you know, speak where, you know, with, with you and other comrades wherever. But it's very frustrating because it's like I, I know lots of good people, but I in various organizations, but I could never join. I'm like. I'm sorry, yeah. I'm, I'm not gonna be campaigning for Ed Markey. It's not my thing. I really don't have a desire to defend the Islamic Republic of Iran as some kind of emancipated place. <laughs> so I'm not, I don't have a place in PSL or, you know, the, the, or what have you. Yeah, there's a limit to my ability to stand for the Democratic People's Republic of, uh, of, of Korea. Yeah, it's um, like I don't want the U.S. to bomb them, but I don't think yeah, uh, leave them alone. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, but but I'm not really, you know, I'm sorry that the Kim is not. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I get you, and and you know, <laughs> it's not my thing. <laughs> although it's it's funny to me, like you want to talk about the history, the weird history of Trotskyism. This is a history that the PSL tries to erase. Um, I think, um, or at least doesn't talk about. Because when I, I have actually pointed out the PSL is a split from the WWP mm -hmm. and that Sam Marcy, even though he was a he was a quote tanky unquote on the question of the Hungarian, um, you know, on the Prague Spring, um, and on you know the Hungarian counterinsurgency or whatever, um, the he was a Trotskyist. and mm -hmm. I'd, I'd I'd now I've recently gone to his Facebook page and they erased that. Like, um, like it's been taken off. He's like, he was a Marxist Leninist. And I'm like, he was a Leninist, sure, but he wasn't a Marxist Leninist. Like, so the, the PSL has the PSL and the WDT, which are now seen as like the pre the uh primary place for anti revisionist Marxism. Um in, in the great irony of history, they were both Trotskyist parties. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, the PSL maybe you could debate wasn't because the WWP had already gone its way, but it's a split from the same party. It basically inherited international answer. I mean, and that's how it came to some level of prominence. Right. Um, and I would, I would say even you know, I would be surprised if when I talk to people even in the PSL, they don't know this. Some of them will even tell me, "Oh, we don't like the fact that they go on the internet and show for." For, for Stalin or whatever. And I'm like, then, then why are you in it? And they're like, well, I don't want to be in the DSA. And, you know, they actually show up and do work. And that's where a lot of people are. And, you know, um, I, I mean, I don't want to say this is all Michael Harrington's fault because it's not all Michael Harrington's no. fault. <laughs> um, it's not even mostly Michael Harrington's fault. A lot of this actually, if you read Christopher Lash, has been a unfortunately a trend going back to the 19 teens. I mean, like basically after Debs, a lot of this stuff starts going this way. Um, but he didn't help. No, and, he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I don't know. I mean, I, and, and if, if you really want to intervene in this now, there's not a whole lot you can do. Like, you know, people have told me, why don't you join the DSA and try to change it from within? And I'm like, why don't I join the Democrats and try to change it from within? I'm fundamentally opposed to its structure. Like, I don't have a problem. I, I actually think 80% of the people in the DSA are probably my comrades, right? Like, in some, they're, I am on a spectrum with them, whether I like it or not. But, you know, and I, you know, I, I work with them. I work with them in the context of zero. I work with them on independent stuff. When I do organizing, which I haven't really done since the summer, um, I, I, you know, you can't, you, I have to work with PSL and DSA. There's no, like, you don't have a choice. Like, it's like, it'd be like, I'm not going to work with college anarchists. Well, okay, well, then you're not going to do anything. Um, but, but like, what, what do you, what, what, 
what do we have for us? And if you try to make it, like, what base do you make it out of? Because the other thing is, is like, a lot of this is still in the hey, you know, I guess the base builders are the few people who've tried to deal with this, but like mm -hmm. that this labor bureaucracy problem and and neoliberalism's mm -hmm. finishing the nail in the coffin of the of the long decline of American labor, which really starts in the forties. Um, we think of the heyday as the fifties, but things were already beginning to unravel. Um, and the cooperation was basically because the U.S. was flush with money. Um, the what what class base do we even have to build off of anymore? I mean, yes, there's a massive working class. Yes, there are actions happening. Yes, there's like the seeds of mass politics actually everywhere now, and yet it doesn't seem to be able to go anywhere. Oh, uh, I mean, uh, it, there is no, what is our organizing center, right? It's like you can have all like these upsurges, you know, break out, like you say, of all these sprouts of mass politics, but there's really no organization right now that can really attract them on like a, to the left of DSA, really. And that's the problem. And that's, you know, that's something we need to overcome. How exactly that happens, I'm, I have guesses and ideas, but nothing completely well thought out right now. And COVID certainly doesn't help like in those prospects, just because it's like people are still afraid to go out and be around other people right now. Um, but so an interesting side note, I've met older members of Workers World who did consider themselves Trotskyists. And I remember recommending Trotsky to me, which was just interesting. Um, and there were some people in PSL who seemed open to like, outside of like the very hardcore tanky stuff. It's like, oh, I'll, I'll you know, look at Trotsky, you know, maybe Grover Fur is wrong about that. And <laughs> okay, like the fact that your 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 main historical thinker is Grover Fur, like I like again, I used to remember like Maoist at least had the decency to rely on people like Shira Fitzpatrick and and uh who are yeah, not actual historians. Actually, yeah, and and I mean they read them weirdly. Um, and they'd even go and find like a, an anti -com an anti communist like Kotkin who's honest about Stalin and try to like redeem find bits of redemption in Kotkin, right? But <laughs> like, um, but the fact that they're now like Grover Fur was right, and I'm like, what? <laughs> like, I don't know a serious Soviet historian on the planet, including Russian ones, who take that very seriously. <laughs> No, it's it's just a weird subculture of of uh, tankyism, Stalinism, or, or Marxism, Leninism, whatever you want to call it. And I've read far too much for for my taste, but uh, you know, at yeah, least Fitzpatrick I mean, like, is an actual historian and writes great stuff. I mean, no, I for example, like like if you and I, I think you've written a critique of settlers, and I also like romanized yeah. the parts of it, but like settlers. Seems like Pulitzer Prize winning history compared to Grover Fur. Yes, there's like, actual true stuff in that. There's, there, yeah, there's a fair amount of true stuff in that. <laughs> true stuff. Um, there's some weird interpretations. <laughs> yes, of that there's, in there, but like, <laughs> but, but where it's just like Grover Fur is like, I don't know. Everything Stalin ever said was. It, it is weird. It's like the mirror image of the the rich. Um, Stalin had all these people. We don't have any evidence of it, but it's like it's like that. <laughs> um, oh man! Well, so we've talked about everything and sounded on a real up on a real downbeat. No, I, I think the the thing that, that we need to take take approach to is even if you're in the DSA. Um, really explore the history of Michael Harrington and the history of your organization deeper than what they're probably going to teach you. And I don't think it's a conspiracy that they're not teaching you, but it's not in their priorities that you know the history of their organization. Maybe you should learn it. Um, and your book will help people do that. And I'm assuming your bibliography will help people do a lot of it. Yeah. Um, well, not just assuming it. I read your book, so I know. So, um, and so we will, hopefully this will get the conversation started. Um, it, it, I, 
you know, we're not going to out specific publishers here, but you did have trouble getting it accepted. And I think that is partly because people are very hesitant right now to critique the DSA directly. Um, and that to me is a little weird. So we'll see where this all goes. So, well, right, yeah, so that's... buy the book and thank you for having me on. Yeah, buy the book when it comes out. And uh, thanks for coming on in this broadcast.